Welcome, today we are going to take a look at the disturbing Reddit posts iceberg. If you found the video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe. The iceberg was posted by a now deleted user. Disclaimer. This video has elements that may be found disturbing by some. So viewer discretion is advised. The lamp story refers to a comment posted in the thread, have you ever felt a deep personal connection to a person you met in a dream only to wake up feeling terrible because you realize they never existed? Were you slash tempt to toss in that reads? Throw away account, cause this is really personal. My last semester, at a certain college I was assaulted by a football player, for walking where he was trying to drive, note he was 325 pounds I was 120 pounds, while unconscious on the ground I lived a different life. I met a wonderful young lady, she made my heart skip and my face red. I pursued her for months and dispatched a few jerk boyfriends before I finally won her over, after two years we got married and almost immediately she bore me a daughter. I had a great job and my wife didn't have to work outside of the house, when my daughter was two she, my wife, bore me a son. My son was the joy of my life, I would walk into his room every morning before I left for work and doted on him and my daughter. One day, while sitting on the couch I noticed that the perspective of the lamp was odd, like inverted. It was still in 3D, but, just. Wrong. It was a square lamp base, red with gold trim on four legs, and a white square shade. I was transfixed, I couldn't look away from it. I stayed up all night staring at it, the next morning I didn't go to work, something was just not right about that lamp. I stopped eating, I left the couch only to use the bathroom at first, soon I stopped that too as I wasn't eating or drinking. I stared at the fucking lamp for three days, before my wife got really worried, she had someone come and try to talk to me, by this time my cognizance was breaking up and my wife was freaking out. She took the kids to her mother's house just before I had my epiphany. The lamp is not real. The house is not real, my wife, my kids, none of that is real, the last 10 years of my life are not fucking real. The lamp started to grow wider and deeper, it was still inverted dimensions, it took up my entire perspective and all I could see was red, I heard voices, screams, all kinds of weird noises, and I became aware of pain. A fucking shit ton of pain, the first words I said were I'm missing teeth and opened my eyes. I was laying on my back on the sidewalk surrounded by people that I didn't know, lots were freaking out, I was completely confused. At some point a cop scooped me up, dragged slash walked me across the sidewalk and grass and threw me face down in the back of a cop car, I was still confused. I was taken to the hospital by the cop, seems he didn't want to wait for the ambulance to arrive and give CT scans and shit. I went through about three years of horrid depression, I was grieving the loss of my wife and children and dealing with the knowledge that they never existed, I was scared that I was going insane as I would cry myself to sleep hoping I would see her in my dreams. I never have, but sometimes I see my son, usually just a glimpse out of my peripheral vision, he is perpetually five years old and I can never hear what he says. Edit, 24 hours after post, never though anyone would read this, I changed a line so that it no longer seems that my two-year-old daughter bore a child. I have never seen Inception or the Star Trek episode so many have mentioned, but I will eventually. I will not do an AMA. I've had many PMs describing similar experiences and three posters stating such experiences are impossible, I'd say more research needs to be done on brain functions. Pre-med students, don't assume you know everything. A few have asked if they can write a book slash screenplay slash stage play slash rage comic etc, please consider this tale open source and have fun with it. Vagina bacon refers to a user and the situation they found themselves in. Most of the talking in that situation is done by the pictures which I can't show you so I will only include one comment and let you figure the rest. Well, Reddit. I've done the unthinkable. Hopefully this won't get buried under these great comments. After so much wonderful feedback, I decided to go through with Splunatic 15's unintentional suggestion and fry my vaginal bacon. Before anyone asks, I decided to not take a bite. I did smell it, however, and it smelled fucking delicious. So, I was pretty tempted, you know. Then I remembered it came from my cunt. My mother has poisoned me refers to a user that made a few posts about his suspicions that his mom poisoned him, which seems to be true. Post 1, my mother has poisoned me. This is a throwaway account. Ever since I became an adult about a decade ago, my mother has been against me moving out of the house. I finally got a job as a line cook three years ago. My mother, and rest of family, which includes my sister and father, has been against it, mainly saying that such a job cannot sustain me, which was true. They also said that I would hate working, which turned out to be false. About a year and a half later, I quit due to health reasons. The following spring, I got a new job as a computer programmer. While they seemed supportive at first, my mother and sister, who I lived with, gradually became hostile. Eventually, I moved out of the house. 
About a month later, I lost my job, and about three months later, moved back home. Everything was cool at first, but as I was getting calls from recruiters and going to job interviews, they gradually became more hostile again, accusing me of being distant and not caring for them. However, they seemed to be very controlling and hateful of the fact that I wanted to move out and wanted a decent job. So last month, I finally got that job as a programmer again, but it was out of town. I had just enough money to relocate to the new city. They became very hostile, starting a few days before I left, accusing me of not loving them, of hating them. On the day before I was scheduled to leave my mother gave me two of the styrofoam ramen noodles cups, and tore that cardboard covering that normally comes with it and threw it away. I was suspicious that they would try to sabotage my life, so I was careful in not trying to anger them. She gave a few more food items, which I didn't use, to take on the trip with me. When I arrived at my new city and entered my hotel room, I chilled out. I was to go to work the next day. So, after the first day at work, I ate a cup of ramen noodles and felt ill. I knew that feeling because my sister fed me something that made me feel the same way in late 2011, which I then assumed was because of my recent illness. I felt weak, lightheaded, and short of breath. I drank water to make me feel better, because that's what I did last time that happened to me. Over the week, my mother kept calling me, making sure to remind me to eat my ramen noodles, I was short on cash then, waiting for my first paycheck. I never told her that I ate it. I suspected then that I had been poisoned, and after doing some googling, believed it was cyanide. Now that is something that you should never have to think, that your own mother would do that to you. So I resisted that thought, because I simply could not bear to think that. So, I went to http colon slash slash cyanidetest.com and ordered a kit, and I tried it. Now, look at the graphics and the video on this page. Now, here are the results of my test. I guess I am going to have to call the cops, and I will never speak to my family again. Edit, thank you for being my support group. You will get updates on this story. Update, 8.45 a.m. I am currently in Topeka, Kansas. I work downtown in a government office building, which has a police department. I visited the Capitol Police station here and spoke to an officer. I showed him the evidence, and he said that he could do nothing about it since the package was opened and might have been contaminated. So, does anyone have ideas? Colon. Post 2, my mother has poisoned me, too. A few months ago, I posted this. I was only able to file a police report, but only that, so far. The police do not have enough evidence to investigate. I have gone no contact with my family. I currently live in a cheap motel in Topeka, Kansas. Yesterday, after getting home from work, I work for the Kansas state government as a software developer. The lady at the front desk told me that my mother called them to speak to me. For security reasons, the motel needs both a name and room number, and my mother didn't have my room number. She didn't even attempt to call me cell phone, which makes me believe that she just wanted to know if I was staying there, and where. So, this morning, I leave a little earlier than usual. The sky was still in the early twilight phase. I take the bus to and from work because my car blew a gasket almost a year ago, before I moved and got my current job. As I was talking towards the bus stop, I saw someone in a strange car, she told me that if she visited, she would be using a rental car, using the finger to tell me to come here. I looked, but kept on walking. Then she opened the car door, and she was in a black outfit and a hood, which is strange for my mother. Then I knew it was her when I saw her face. She told me to come here, and I said no, kept a good distance. She said that she just wanted to know if I was okay. So I said yes, I am. She said that she just wanted a hug, but I said no. I don't know if there was anyone else in the car with her, but she is a gun owner, and a good shot. She routinely kicked all of our asses in duck hunt when I was a little kid, and still pawned when playing Wii games with the gun controller. I ended up taking another bus to get to my job. So, when I get off of work, what is the best way to go home, or should I even go? If not, where should I go? I really think that it is not safe for me here in Topeka. So if anyone knows of any .NET development jobs, please PM me. Also, please give me some advice. And as a final note it is his comment, and by the way, I have moved out of state since making my left thread with this account, and am doing very well with a nice job, and am in better health. Brandy Wole slash Jason in Hell refers to a series of posts made by you slash Jason in Hell. He deleted his account and the posts are no longer, so I'm gonna use you slash quality proofs post from our slash museum of Reddit. Post 1. I'm, 30 slash M, having a hard time, coping with my wife, 29 slash F, having cheated on me, with our neighbor, 51 slash M. So to go back to the beginning, I had just taken on a new project and new responsibilities at work. I was working a lot of hours, 60 plus per week, and was noticeably stressed. 
It was in May of 2015 that I noticed that she had added a password to her phone. When confronted about it, she told me it was because she was planning my father's day present and didn't want me to ruin the surprise. About a week later, she came to me and told me that she felt guilty keeping a big secret from me and told me that she was having our neighbor, a contractor, build a home office for me as my present. It struck me as odd as in our six years together, she has never said she felt guilty about anything and always insists that she never regrets anything in her life. Time goes on, her phone is still password protected, and things don't feel right. I see her using her phone and smiling to herself more and more often. But when I ask her what she is doing she says nothing and puts her phone away. So one morning I wait for her to get in the shower and I grab her phone before it requires the password. I go through her messages and find that she is texting the neighbor, I am all covered in frosting, you wanna lick it off? There were no other messages to the neighbor but I found out later that was because she had set up her phone to delete messages after a certain amount of time. I felt uncomfortable with it but I knew she had a perverted sense of humor and I thought she would never do anything to hurt me. More time goes by and the neighbor is spending more and more time at our house but the office is being completed slower and slower. I can't help but worry that something isn't right so I start checking her location using Google Timeline. It was at this point that I realized that there are large gaps in her GPS history because she was turning off her phone's GPS. Fast forward to July and at this point the paranoia is driving me nuts so I tell her that I need to install new antivirus on her phone. While she has it unlocked for me, I install anti-theft software so I can remotely turn the GPS back on and set up AT&T message backup and restore so I can read all of her text messages from that point on my computer. The next day my mother asks to spend time with my two kids so my wife drops them off with her and has the day to herself. I watch my wife's activity from work as she spends the day trying to meet up with a neighbor but is unsuccessful because he is busy with another job site. That night we get the kids back from my mom's house and we go out to dinner with the neighbor, his girlfriend, and his son. My wife and his girlfriend are having a good time drinking, laughing, and just joking around. His girlfriend mentions that she'd would like to see Magic Mike XXL, I say it's a good idea, I'll watch the kids so my wife and her can go, so my wife and her go, and the neighbor, and I go back to my house so the kids can play video games together. The kids are back in my son's room, playing games, and the neighbor is sitting across from me on the other couch. It is at this point that my wife starts texting him. She is describing sex acts she would like to perform with him and he is reciprocating. She tells him to check his Snapchat and at the same time I get a Snapchat from her too, and it is her fingering herself in a bathroom stall. They keep talking, trying to figure out when they can meet up and have sex. They decide on Monday morning after I go to work. So in my head, I had already planned to pretend to leave and circle back to catch them. But then they tell each other that they love each other and it is all I can do to not leap off the couch and knock him out. But I contain myself and continue reading the conversation unfolding in front of me. Then he tells her, you're my girl now, to which she replies, always have been, ending with him writing, and always will be. My wife and the neighbor's girlfriend return from the movie and I ask them, politely, to sit down. I then ask the kids to stay in my son's room and shut the door. I return to the living room and confront my wife and the neighbor. I say, so you two love each other, huh? My wife goes into full-blown denial mode and the neighbor's girlfriend starts smacking him. I ask my wife if she has been texting him, she says no. So I show her the text messages, she admits to it but says it was the first time it had gone that far. I ask my wife if she has sent him pictures, she says no. So I show her the picture, she admits it but says it was the first time. I ask her if she is having sex with him and she says no. Because I didn't wait to catch them having sex together, I didn't have evidence to prove her wrong so that one stayed unresolved. I tell her that I am leaving her, she tells me that she will make sure I never see my kids again if I do. She planned on using the fact that I had attempted suicide in high school to prove me unfit to have the children. She continues to say that it was my fault for being so busy with work and stressed out that she just wanted someone she could talk to. Then she gives me an ultimatum to decide what I'm going to do or she will decide for me. The neighbor's girlfriend starts defending the two of them saying that it couldn't have been serious if they weren't having sex and that my wife and I are too perfect together to let this break us up. The neighbors go home and my wife and I argue for the rest of the night about what we are going to do. We go to bed separately having not resolved anything. We keep going back and forth on the subject all weekend and finally settle on we were going to separate temporarily while we figure out what we want. I was going to stay in the house and she was going to take the kids and go to her mom's house. That Monday, I go to work and I get text from her in the middle of a meeting with my bosses stating that she had explained things to our kids, but that they were upset and I need to explain it to them also. I get home from work to find my kids crying. She had told them that mommy had to move out because dad was mad at her. When my son wanted to stay with me she told him that he can't. 
My son put it together that if mommy has to move out because I'm mad at her and he must move out then I must have been mad at him too. My daughter was crying because my son was, I don't think she was old enough to understand what was happening. It was at that moment I realized she was going to drag the kids through hell if I left her so I swallowed my feelings and begged her to stay. She agreed and insisted that I apologize to our neighbor since we were still going to need to hang out with them because our sons are good friends. I hate it but I do it anyway, we still hang out with them from time to time and they come to our various birthday and holiday parties. But I'd do anything for my kids and I behave civil every time. Things die down for a while, I still think about it constantly. I worry how can I keep from making her so unhappy that she cheats on me again. Then almost a year, from the original incident, around Father's Day again, she sent him pictures again. She claims it was an accident that she meant to send them to me instead. I don't fully believe her, but I move on anyway. Things have been quiet on that front for about four months now, but I still think about it constantly. This is going to sound stupid, but I feel like I have a part of my brain that I can't shut off, that is always thinking. I used to use that to solve programming problems, and it made me very good at my job. But ever since this incident, the only thing it thinks about is her and him and if I did the right thing. My job performance has suffered and I feel like I haven't gotten sleep in months. I'm afraid that after this much time, and the fact that I begged her back, that to say that I want a divorce now would only make her more vindictive towards my children and I. I just feel like I have put myself so deep in a hole that I can never get back out. I haven't really talked to anyone about this. I didn't want to talk to my mom about it because I felt she would treat my wife differently and I didn't need the two fighting any more than they already do. I tried talking to one friend about it but his advice was to put my trust in God but that was not much solace for me as I am an atheist. So I have no clue what to do with my feelings or how to move on from this. Post 2. Update, I'm taking your advice. Instead of trying to fix something she doesn't want to fix, she has refused counseling several times in the past before this even happened, I am going to get myself and my kids out. I meet with an attorney next week. Thank you everyone for helping me see how far I had my head up my ass colon. Post 3, update, thank you. I would like to give a heartfelt and sincere thank you for the advice and support I have received here. No one could have foreseen the tragedy that resulted from me filing for divorce. You guys perform a wonderful service to those in need and I hope you continue to do so in the future. Edit, I would never ask for donations, I think it is incredibly tacky. I've worked very hard for everything I have in life. But because there has been a GoFundMe created by her family and I can't guarantee that they won't turn around and use it to support her in some way, I just ask that you help spread the GoFundMe that my employer created for me. Post 4, Indiana, USA, I need GoFundMe advice. If anyone has any experience with GoFundMe that could give me advice it would be greatly appreciated. My former mother-in-law has created a GoFundMe using my last name and pictures of the children to raise funds for the mother who murdered them. She intends to use them for her daughter's medical and legal expenses. What can slash should be done about this? Post 5, an update from Jason and Hell. TLDR, I am doing better and I continue to get better every day. The first thing you may notice is this is being posted from a different account. I deleted the slash you slash Jason and Hell account in a knee-jerk reaction to seeing my Reddit posts in the news. I guess the first question to answer is how am I doing, and to that I would say I am doing well. I have bad days, but I would think that is to be expected. It is just important that I, or anyone going through something, continue to use the support of friends and family as well as good coping skills to not let myself be completely defeated on those bad days. I won't lie, I struggled to get back to where I am. For some time I refused to sleep because of combination of fear of what I would wake up to and nightmares about that night. For a time I used alcohol to sleep but my family loved me enough to take it from me before it became a damaging and permanent habit. I was hospitalized because I did have thoughts of ending my life because I missed my children so much. From that I learned that you should never be ashamed of your mental health and not seeking treatment will only make it worse, not better. We have all heard it, but if you or a loved one is struggling seek immediate assistance. Your life is too important to throw away in a moment of weakness. By putting off treatment I only caused everything else in my life to suffer. I lost my job and became reclusive to the house. But don't worry I have been back to work since December and I have nearly regained my former position and salary, so I am good and require no assistance. The second question would be how do I feel about the sentencing? That is something that is harder to answer because no matter what the sentence nothing will bring back my beloved children. Do I think she should have gotten the death penalty, which Indiana has, no I do not. She wanted to die and after 9 years of giving her what she wanted when she wanted it I was not going to give her another thing. Do I think the life sentence will have any appreciable effect on her? I don't know, one thing she always stressed for the entire time that I knew her was that she lived her life without any regrets. 
Even after I caught her cheating on me, she continued to say she had no regrets. As for the ex-in-laws, they continue to be a problem to this day. Shortly after everything happened, they changed the locks on the home I was renting from them with my property still inside. After trying to civilly negotiate the return of the property, it was required that I involve law enforcement. That is an ongoing legal battle. A member of the family accused me of stealing property I had purchased from them prior to the death of the children and threatened to take action against me unless I paid double what I had already paid them. I alerted the authorities and as far as I know that is resolved, they continue to make visiting my children's grave difficult, during the one-year anniversary they sat in their truck and just watched me the whole time I was visiting the grave. Because of that I don't visit the grave as often as I would like to. If I can impart on you something I have learned through all of this, it is that you should always take the time to be with the ones you love. It doesn't matter if they are asking you to read The Pokey Little Puppy for the millionth time or asking you to play Smash Brothers even though you both know they will wipe the floor with you every time, just do it because you never know what time will be the last time. Always make sure they know how much you love them, I had the fortune that the last thing my children ever heard me say was, I love you, good night. I will see you in the morning. Scott Kleeschult is a missing child that went missing in June 8, 1988, from St. Charles, Missouri. The Reddit aspect of it comes with a comment by a now-deleted user that reads. This still haunts me to this day. As kids, we had a hideout in this dirt cliff slash cove. This is the best approximation I can find on Google, only 3x taller and probably 10x as wide. There was a neighborhood kid who, in hindsight, was probably mentally handicapped in some way, but to us, he was just the weird slash creepy kid, this was the 80s and we weren't exactly raised PC, three of us were headed to our base and found creepy kid sitting at the top in our guard chair. We yelled at him to get out, and he said something like make me, and started lobbing dirt clods and sticks down at us. We all ran around the side to make our way up. It gets pretty fuzzy here, but all I remember is he fell. I still remember the sound. When we got back down to check on him, he was in a very awkward position with blood coming out of his mouth. We all just freaked out and ran home, and as far as I know, no one has spoken a word of this to anyone, we didn't go back for over a month, and never said a word of it between us. Again, this was the 80s, so media wasn't like today. Chances are it got a small article in the newspaper B section, missing mentally disabled child found dead after fall or something like that. And after some users found about Scott's case, they pointed the similarities. I don't know if the user deleted the comment because that may have been Scott or because they found about Scott so they could have found about the child that he talked about, or maybe the comment was a hoax and he feared he was going to be found guilty for something he didn't do. The man who ate his foot refers to a post made by you slash incredibly shiny shart. Hi all, I am a man who ate a portion of his own amputated leg. Ask me anything. So the quick and dirty, about two years ago, I was hit on my motorcycle. The salvaged my foot, but I would never be able to walk on it. I elected to have it amputated. I asked the doctors to keep it. I signed some papers. I got it back, and with the help of some friends, cooked a portion of the tibialis anterior. Proof foot tacos, more proof me, and my stump. Let's do this. Edit, I taste like buffalo, but chewier. Super beefy and little fat. The homicidal memoir, I think it refers to this confession bare mean that Redditors used for telling often truths, albeit small and inoffensive ones. With the captions made by you slash Narado, for this specific confession being, my sister had an abusive meth addict boyfriend. I killed him with his own drugs while he was unconscious, and they ruled it as an overdose with a follow-up comment. First, and only comment to be made here by me. I posted this wondering what would happen, there is some truth behind it, but I'm not saying what was true and what wasn't. If I had a dollar for every time someone took me too seriously on the internet, I would be able to retire from today alone. I'm sorry to anyone that I've offended to the point of ruining their lives. To everyone else, get fucked. It's the damn internet. If you want to catch a murderer, get out of your house, put on some fucking tights, and go fight crime. I'm quite done with Reddit for tonight. Back to the shadows of lurking, the world isn't quite ready for me. Edit, the reason for this post and the admittance it was a joke is because people started posting my own personal information on there. Not shit that was in my post history. Sure, you can find out information about me, but linking me to something that happened is completely different. I made a meme about something, and it was turned into people revealing my personal information. It was quite rude and very uncalled for. Radasblue 101 refers to a user that confessed to murdering his girlfriend slash ex-girlfriend. The post title being, Wanted for Kitchener Murder My Side. With the confession being his side of the story. I understand the early judgments made by society, distancing myself makes it seem like I am trying to escape a crime. I'm not. 
I'm only trying to give myself some space and fully take in what happened before I turn myself in. The fact is no one is more destroyed than I am. She was more than a girlfriend, a soon-to-be fiancé, she was my everything, what happened that night was nothing but tragic. Looking back. We've been in a relationship for a year and three months. This was the first serious, long-term relationship for the both of us so everything we did was a new experience. We traveled the world, our families met, had fights and made up, talked seriously about marriage and kids, the whole deal. I would never physically hurt her in any way. She would occasionally hit or slap me when I said something stupid, but I'd laugh it off. She met all my friends and family, wherever I went she was there, she would come to my house from Kitchener every week, about an hour. Starting Fridays, and would stay for three to four days. We were incredibly used to each other. The last month of our relationship I started asking her to give me some space so I can work on my job. She started coming less and less like I asked. During March her friend Anna got pregnant. Melinda and Anna then moved in together because Anna has a big family and wanted privacy in case she keeps the baby. I never met any of Melinda's friends at this stage. 1.2 years in. She told me all her friends only use her, that part was incredibly clear to me. They would only contact her if they needed their hair done or had BF problems. Including Anna. 1.3 months in, April, Melinda and I got into an argument via text and our relationship ended. I went to her apartment that day, to try and talk. Every time I tried breaking up with her, she would call my mom or drive down to my house so this time I figured I'd do the same. Upon arrival I was confronted by Anna's brother and her boyfriend. A physical altercation took place and the police were involved. At this stage I knew if we were to patch things up it would be rough. We didn't see each other for a few weeks. Later on in April, Melinda and I started texting each other again. We agreed to see each other and talk. April 29th. She was originally supposed to drive down to my house but felt sick so I told her I would come and she agreed. Melinda told me Anna and her boyfriend were present. Incident from before might make things awkward, I didn't mind. Upon arrival, it was just Melinda. She said Anna went to drop Christina off at a club, Melinda's sister, she invited me to her room right away. We cuddled and talked, we never spend so much time away from each other. We just cuddled, kissed and talked about everything. A while later Anna came back with another friend. She asked Melinda if everything was okay and Melinda said yes. Anna will attest to this if she is honest, we continued to talk and finally decided it was worth it to try one more time. However Melinda didn't want anyone to know. Especially, her family, she said after the police were involved and a physical altercation with Anna's brother and BF things wouldn't be right if they knew right away. I agreed we would keep it on the down low until things cooled down. We continued to talk. Anna and her other friend left the house to grab food. We both let everything out and our relationship was back on track. As I'm getting ready to leave she asks me if I had done anything with any other girls while we were on break or any time we were on break. I told her we needed to be honest and said yes and told her about it, she started freaking out. Wouldn't say a word and just kept slapping me with tears in her eyes. Slaps turned into hits. I told her I was sorry but if she didn't stop I'd do something back. She didn't stop. I then stupidly pushed her, harder than I expected. She fell against the sink. This was the first time I ever did something phyically violent towards her. I told her I was sorry. She said, leave. Leave now. I began saying sorry even more and asked if I could get a hug. She was still crying. I go up to her to try and give her a hug, almost out know where she grabs a knife by the sink. Initially, I thought was just going to hold it to try and tell me to leave. She doesn't. She comes at me in full force, aiming towards my face. I tell her to stop. She doesn't, I tried grabbing the knife, but ended up cutting my hands. After a few cuts I lost it. I freaked out, I was scared and in a state of shock. Never in a hundred years did I think she would use a knife against me. Out of shock and fear I grab one. I hit her with it, almost blindly. A few times. I didn't know what happened. I was confused, shocked and scared. I had no intentions of that happening. When I left I honestly thought she just passed out. Then I looked at the blood and started freaking out and just ran. I didn't for sure she had died until the next day. I honestly had no intentions of ever doing that to her, I was protecting myself. She was with me the most, we were each other's best friends, she would tell me everything. Her deepest secrets that not even her friends or family knows. The amount of regret and sadness is beyond words. Everyone else is just reading or talking about it. I lived it, I was there. I did it. 
every waking second I relive that moment. At this stage life is really not worth it for me. Although it was out of shock and protection I should have just accepted getting hit. Maybe I would have lived, maybe not. Anything is better than living with this. I'm reading the news and they are claiming it was targeted. Or an act of terrorism? Why would I buy her roses that night if I was planning on killing her? I didn't even go home that night. I always have a passport in the car and decided to just get away for a few days before turning myself in or killing myself. If any of it was planned I would have taken my stuff, I would have took okay cash. I'm in the United States with $200, no clean clothes, nothing. I didn't intend on any of it. It was out of fear and protecting myself alongside shock. I'm sorry, to everyone. Especially Melinda's family. I know it will not will be accepted but no I didn't mean anything bad to happen that night when I went there. Rest in peace my beautiful, I hope you forgive me in the afterlife. Pictures of our last text convo. Pictures of us as couple. Some people think I was a complete stranger and just killed her. For the butcher I couldn't find anything except reviews for the 2008 movie and video game mysteries or characters. One that could fit is a mention of the butcher of Mons in our slash unsolved mysteries and a nosleep story about an ex-wife that killed the husband's employees and trying to frame it on him so she can get the kids. The Whistler is about a comment made by you slash bing bong 1234 in an escredit post with the tile, serious, what is the creepiest thing that has ever actually happened to you? With the comment being, I've been waiting a long time to tell Reddit the full story of the Whistler. This story requires many details, but it is unexplainable, creepy, and 100% true. I also have video evidence. When I was about 8 years old I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood with my mom. It was maybe 11 p.m. We live next to a swamp slash woods area on the edge of our neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan. I remember it being very silent and slightly windy. From down in the swamp, we heard somebody whistling at us. It sounded sort of like a bird, but each whistle was different enough where the lack of consistency made it human-like. The whistle sounded higher, then lower. I can't really describe it. My mom had a concerned, slightly terrified look on her face and grabbed my hand and said that we should go inside quickly. I didn't understand because I was too young, but seeing my mom freak out made me freak out too. After a while, though, I kind of forgot about it. Two years later, I was taking my dog out again, late at night. There is a large bush that could easily obscure a person behind it just next to the front door. As I was finishing the walk, the whistling noise started again, same pitches, same inconsistent, human-like tones. As soon as I heard it, a chill went down my spine as I remembered exactly the feeling of seeing my mom terrified, looking down into the swamp at something I couldn't see, maybe she couldn't either. I ran inside as fast as possible. Years went by, and I thought about it less and less, I told only a handful of people, and eventually it slipped from my mind. Fast forward to last summer, I'm 24, started dating my girl Sarah. We moved out to South Dakota for work. For Independence Day, we decided to go to Pierre, South Dakota, and watch the fireworks along the bank of the Missouri River. There was a free camping spot behind a hospital where you could pitch your tent, hang out, and see the fireworks up the river. We were near the end of the campground and there were very few people around us. As it was getting dark, the fireworks began. They were pretty far away, so the illumination they brought was very little. Thus, we had to sit right at the edge of the river to be able to see them. A huge thunderhead was moving in and a storm was imminent, so the air seemed electric and the wind was picking up. The atmosphere was eerie to say the least. The police boats herded all the other boats off of the river and had left our area to do that elsewhere. Most of the other campers walked up the river to have a better view of the fireworks, but Sarah and I stayed back and were drinking PBR Tallboys and kicking it. Suddenly, we heard the sound of a paddle methodically dipping into the water. We saw a figure steering a canoe about 20 m offshore. Sarah decided to go get more beers from the car, leaving me alone to stare at this mystery person. And then, of course, they whistled at me. My entire body was frozen and covered in goosebumps. It was the exact same whistler from my childhood, more than a decade earlier. I looked at the figure, but it was much too dark to discern who it could be. They were wearing a hat. When they were perpendicular to the shore from me, they stopped paddling, turned the canoe to face directly at me, and whistled right at me. I was so frightened I stood up and shouted at them, Who are you? They didn't say anything, just whistled a couple more times, turned the canoe 180 degrees, and paddled out of sight. I'm a videographer, so I already had my camera by my side and was taking video of the fireworks. As the canoe was almost out of sight, I grabbed my camera and got a shot of them whistling as they went away. When Sarah came back from getting beers, she was very confused as to why I was so freaked out. When I explained, 
She was freaked out a bit too. I was convinced we would both be murdered that night. How did this whistling person follow me, after 14 years, all the way to South Dakota? Was it a coincidence? Why was it the same whistling noise? Who was that person and where did they go? So many questions still unanswered. To this day, I'm more afraid of being outside in the dark where I might hear that whistling again. I'm open to any explanations. If there is interest, I will find a plug and edit a little video of the fireworks and the whistling noise and the canoe disappearing. I'm in Uganda currently and the internet is spotty where I am, so I'll do my best. TLDR whistling person has haunted me since I was a boy. Can't explain. Help. Edit, video is coming, I promise. Where I'm at in Uganda, the power goes out sometimes, so if you don't hear from me either that happened or the whistler finally got me. Edit 2, okay. Finally. I spent all afternoon uploading this video. Here is the link. When I was still getting shots of the fireworks I heard the whistling starting. I was too afraid at that moment to point the camera directly at the canoe, so I just turned my microphone towards it and kept a low-key shot facing downriver towards the fireworks. If you wear headphones, you can hear it better. It's a two-note whistle, high then low. You can hear me ask my GF, are you whistling? Is that you? She said no, but I wasn't sure so I told her, stop it, because I was getting scared. The last shot, I boosted the brightness as much as I could and still make out the person in the canoe. It looks like they're wearing a red sweater or something. Edit, it's been a while and I apologize for that. I'm back in the US now and I asked my mom about it. I sat her down and played the video for her. She honestly doesn't remember anything like that happening. I wish I had something more exciting to say. Alas, it must remain a mystery. Thanks for watching today iceberg video. If you found the video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can be notified about the next video.